I grew up in a polygamous commune, Pinesdale, Montana, which had been founded by my grandfather, Roland Allred, in the early 1960s to escape persecution for his religious beliefs. However, I was used to any sort of lifestyle, really, because my father only had one wife the whole time I've known him. And, you know, at one point he did have a second wife, but she left shortly after I was born. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any recollection of her. And so it was normal to me to have one wife or multiple wives. And it was basically your preference. And it, it didn't, you know, it didn't, uh, you know, come to my attention that, hey, this is kind of weird or whatnot until I finally started to get older and I started going to public school outside of Pinesdale that I saw, oh, okay, people call us Pineys, so we must be somewhere different. And, you know, it, it, it was fun, though. As a kid, it was a fun place to grow up because you had all these little kids running around like Smurfs playing tag, hide and seek, pine cone wars and whatnot. And, you know, I had over 400 first cousins. <laughs> and wow. I couldn't, I, I wouldn't be able to name them all for you, obviously. But, you know, we, we have fun. I enjoyed it very much. And so, but you know, in, ignorance is bliss. And I was very innocent at the time. And it was a good time. Tell me what it's like specifically to take a seat at the table in a polygamous kitchen. Well, you know, if I always tell the story, if you sit quietly long enough in a polygamous home, you will see all the sister wives and all the dynamics come out very quickly in that Oh, I bet. <laughs> uh, yeah, they will they will band together to, you know, force the husband to give them something. But once one sister wife leaves and then another sister wife leaves, they all kind of start to nip at nip at each other, you know, start backbiting. And then eventually, when the husband comes home and there's only one wife, she'll sell them all down the river to get what she wants. And so it's, it's a fascinating and very entertaining dynamic that you see, and it's human nature. It really is so unrealistic to ask a woman to share her husband with another man and think that it's just going to be all fun and games. <laughs> it, it, it's not. And I could tell you that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You saw a lot of, a lot of ache and anxiety in the women. I remember when my aunt, who I love very much, had to allow her husband to be given away to a second wife. She, on the surface, on the facade, was very calm, and very grateful to be sh sharing her husband to the principle of it. But I remember when he left on his honeymoon, I saw my aunt crying alone in the bedroom. I mean, it was hard. And it's... And a common misnomer that people have is that, you know, all polygamists are sex fiends or whatnot. Or, I mean, no. Actually, a lot of them are very celibate in that very archaic in that you only have intercourse for the sake of procreation. And so it becomes very strict like that. And so it's not, it's not all this romance and beauty that a lot of people, uh, big love, will sometimes portray. And uh, I've, I watched it once, and having my intelligence insulted, I never watched it again. But obviously, that's part of TV entertainment to, you know, sensationalize some aspects that are pretty exaggerated. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.